Hello, everyone. That was a great presentation. And now for our first keynote uh, speak of the day and the first uh, presentation of the day, we have Carlton Gibson. Um, Carlton? Uh, he'll be, he's a Jago Fellow, and he'll be talking to you about how you can become a more active member of this beautiful community we have here with uh, his presentation called Contributing, uh, Feeding the Pony, the pony right there, Contributing Back to Django and How to Make That Work for You. So everyone, please, a big round of applause for Carlton. And he will not be taking any questions after um, his presentation, but he will be more than happy to uh, answer any questions when you catch him at, at the breaks or after lunch. So, yep, no questions after the presentation. Thank you. Hello? Hello? Yeah, right, fine. Hello. Check this. Yep. Yep. Okay. Right. Hello. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, feeding the pony. I'm going to talk about feeding the pony. Who's the pony? Well, Yango's the pony. There's the pony. I'm so glad they've made this. This is amazing. Um. <sighs> The idea back in the day was that when you're asking for all these magical features like declarative models where you just, you know, sell them out and, I don't know, automatic form generation and input validation, all these things, that while you're asking for all these magic features, you might as well just ask for a pony as well, right? The thought was that then we needed a mascot and so, well, the, the Django pony was born. Um, before I go on, it, I kind of think we don't do enough about this you know we should have more t-shirts and more things like that so if you're a, if you're a um a swag making type person let's talk afterwards let's try and make something more happen with the Django pony anyway who am i um i'm carlton gibson so i'm a long-term Django user i've got a book on the shelf that says something like updated for 1.1 so it's around about then um i've been contributing in the Django ecosystem for a number of years i'm a maintainer of Django rest framework i help i help there um, I maintain Django Filter, Django Crispy Forms, I've helped out on other things. And along with Marius, for the last year or so, I've been the Django Fellow. Um, what's the Django Fellow? Well, we're contracted by the Django Software Foundation to do the sort of day-to-day -day tasks on Django. Um, we triage the tickets as they come in. Um, so you go on the issue track, you create a ticket, we try and reproduce it, we make sure it's a valid bug or not. We handle the patch review. Um, so you submit a pull request, we make sure that your pull request gets a review as quickly as we can. Um, we merged most of the um, pull requests now. We do security work, so there's a security issue um, reported, we help there, along with other contributors. We do the releases. Um, and it's the kind of stuff that on a project the size of Django, it just wouldn't get done, it just fall behind. Um, and I guess the point about the fellowship program, what's really good about it, is it hopefully lets contributors, that's you lot, do the exciting stuff of contributing code while we do the more mundane stuff to keep the project ticking over. So the talk, um, contributing back to Django and how to make that work for you. 
why would you do contributing? I'd say, well, A, it's fun. Right? It's fun doing open source. It's fun working on the patches. It's fun um, creating software. Right? We like right, creating software. But it's a great learning opportunity as well. It's really, it really lit ups your ability. It's something that well, it just makes you better. Um, Sorry. And you can take on a ticket, you don't know what it is, you have to work out what the problem is first of all, you then have to create a, a test case for it, you create a patch for it, you'll get your patch reviewed by, you know, um, big, uh, uh, by contributors to Django, and they'll help you improve your code. So it's a great learning opportunity. And if you do it right, and that's what this talk is about, it helps you, it helps you get a job, or it helps you get a better job, right? But but how? And that's what I'm going to talk about today. And the big problem is that Django, well, it eats contributors. It used to be called the meat grinder. People would say, oh, we need some fresh meat for the meat grinder. I hadn't heard this. Um, and why? Well, because expectations, right? There's, ex there's bad expectations around open source. Uh, one of those comes to funding. So let's just do a straw, straw poll quickly. I don't know if we can do it. Who here uses Django in their work in some way? That's okay. That's most of you. Right. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Who keep your hand up if you are in some way senior at your work? Do you have an underling of any kind? Okay, so that's not so many. Right? And keep your hand up if your company contributes to the Django Software Foundation or Django West Framework through Viring Code. Okay, some. Right? Well done, those that, you d that do. Companies don't fund Django. It's not many, right? So all of you use it. Half of you are senior in some respect, and maybe 10% are funding it. Why don't we fund, why don't we fund it? It's tax deductible. Okay? It's one of the best wa ways you can do to improve your hiring process, right? Both in reach to suitable candidates. They hear about you because your logo appears in places. But also in looking credible. A, can, a, quali a qualified candidate comes to, to your interview and you say, oh yeah, and we support the Django Software Foundation, we support Django S Framework. That makes your company much more appealing. Right. The expectation is we won't pay for it. And the expectation almost is that we mustn't pay for it. Um, every time a, a new model is tried, there's a kind of outcry. Oh, this isn't free and open source anymore. So the example that comes to my mind is Redis. Right? Redis have got the core, which is BSD license, and then they recently introduced this, the ability to create mo modules that sort of bolt on extra functions. So Redis Labs, who's the company that funds most of Redis development, they created a graph um, database module, and they created a full text um, search module. And they put those under a license, which is for me as a user is totally open source. I can use those in any product. I just can't use them in if I want to create another database product. Right? So they've just tried to protect their position there. And yet there was an outcry. There was Linux distributions threatening to stop packaging Redis because it wasn't free and open source anymore. And no, I don't, the Redis example is just an example. The, but the point is that kind of reaction whenever people try and make any money out of open source or try and find a way of funding it. It's deeply toxic, I think. Um, now, in the, with DSF, with Django, we're really, really lucky. We're in a fortunate position. Um, but if you didn't put your hand up or you didn't keep your hand up on the funding, I'd like to think hard about that and whether your company can fund the DSF or Django REST framework or any other projects that you depend on. But it's not just funding, it's time, right? There is a, there's a kind of expectation that once you start contributing to open source that you somehow owe the community something. That, when you, that you have to be there, that you have to turn up, no matter what the cost to you personally, right, that you have an, a responsibility, that you're letting people down. Now, I, I've been somewhat fortunate in that as I was getting involved in open source, I saw people that were massively influential to me and mass, have been massively influential to Django. I saw them struggling, and I saw their struggle, and I was able to um, well, adjust my own behavior and not, not fall into this this trap, but it's it's really toxic. And again, this is where we're lucky to have the fellowship program in the Django 
world because Maris and I are able to do the really the stuff that, would, that really drives you to burnout, but we're doing it on a paid basis, so it's not so it's fine. Okay? And then hopefully, then again, you can contribute to the good stuff, the writing the code bit, which is you know rewarding and a learning opportunity and helps you you know helps you get more jobs and stuff. So let's look at the state we're in. Let me just have a sip of water. Unpopular opinion tech issue. Contributing to open source is a privilege only few can afford. Meritocracy might have. On a similar train, open source is the unpaid internship of computer programming. Right. Here's a graph I showed at DjangoCon last year. It was it shows the commits per contributor between um, when 2.1 was released and DjangoCon last year. It doesn't, the time frame doesn't matter. What matters is the shape of the graph. Because there are 481 commits from 121 separate people, but outside of the core group of the fellows and then half a dozen serious contributors, there's just, there, there aren't very many people. Now, it's OK. It's fine. but the first problem with it is it's just not enough. We need more contributors. Why? Because there are 100, well, 1,300 accepted open tickets on Django. Now, it's okay. Django's mature, right? It's a state, it, it, it's old, but I think well, that's a bit too many for me. I think we need to be a bit more dynamic than having, look at the, this line shows over time, right? You see, it never changes. <laughs> Well, I think we need to be closing some of these. And to do that, we need more bandwidth. We need more people. We need more contributors to come and join us, right? We, we manage to keep Django going. We do well. We add new features. We keep up with all the database updates. But if we had a few more contributors, we could take on that, and we could have more features too. Um, but the bigger problem is that it's just not representative, right? If you look at across the contributors, well, it's quite white and very male. But if you look at that core, well, it's all, it's very, very white and it's all male, right? And that's not representative of the, the Django community as a whole, right? Um, as I say, it could have been any time. Um, so there's another thing going on with Django, which is um, about a thing called Django Core. So historically, if you contributed to Django and you, you made major contributions to Django, you'd be invited to a thing called Django Core. And it m is a list of people who are in it, and it makes it look as if the contributor base is 50 strong. Um, but it's not, because most of those people are emeritus. They're retired. They're not, really, they're not actively contributing to Django. And so it's slightly misleading that this Django Core thing exists. And it's still not representative, because it's all the old white men that have contributed in the past. Um, so there's a uh, Django enhancement proposal to dissolve um, Django Core that will go through this year. And that th the governance of Django will probably be replaced by members of the Django Software Foundation who are active on the Django developer list. They will be the people who probably, they will be the people who have the voting rights to if an issue comes up on Django. So join the Django Sam Software Foundation. And then you can be part of the governance of Django and the running of a technical framework. So that's half the story. Um, we're going to get rid of that um, Django core, and then how do we want to? How, how can we can encourage more people to come in? That would be the rest of the story, right? So I'm not going to talk about the funding problem. We've got the Django Software Foundation. We've got the fellowship program. That's you know, that, it's not perfect. There's more to say there, but that's not going to be my topic. I'm going to talk about the time problem, right? So how can you find time to contribute to Django? Well, can your work help? Let's have another straw part. Who uses Django in their work? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> right, OK. So who, keep your hands up, keep your hands up, keep your hand up if at work you are senior in some way, i.e. you've got an underling of any kind. Who's got a promotion in the last five minutes? Because that's more of you. Oh, hang on. Right. 
So third question, keep your hand up if in your company you encourage and allocate time for working on open source. Okay, hand went up over there. <laughs> that's not bad, right? Because that's what you need to be doing. Your programmers, your staff, they will experiment, right? And you can choose. Are they going to experiment on your code base, on your product, or are they going to experiment on an open source package which gets community oversight from experienced contributors? You can choose that, right? It's a great learning experience. It makes your, your employees better programmers. It allows you to keep up to date. So you've, got, you've installed a third-party app, a Django third-party app, and it's not compatible with the latest version of Django because it's got some bug in it. So you have an option. You can either get stuck on the, on the, out, you know, the last long-term support that's just about to become end-of-life, and then you're running end-of-life software, and every time you try and recruit a new programmer, what version of Django are you running? Oh, we're on 1.5. Oh. Right. Or you can tell your programmers, yeah, no, let's fix that bug. And let's fix the other couple of other issues on that repo. Let's get that third-party package that we depend on compatible with Django 2.2, and let's update. And then all of a sudden, you're on the latest major version, and that's a happy place to be. Not only for your existing programmers, but for your hiring too. Yeah, what version of Django run? Oh, yeah, we're on um, 2.2. Yeah, we'll, we'll be upgrading to 3.0 when that's released. Ah, oh, that's an exciting company. I want to work there. Right? It's a virtuous circle. It's a learning opportunity. It makes your code better. You get all new features. You can hire more easily. It becomes a learning opportunity. Right? Google supposedly allocates 20% time. I don't know if 20% time is too much to ask. What about 10% time? Would one day every two weeks at working on open source, what your dependencies on the dependencies you use, would that really kill you? If your answer to that is yes, then you've got big problems. So allocate time from your work. But what happens if your work won't help you? Well, what about finding time for yourself? Now, I know this can be difficult. What do I know? Aren't I exactly the demographic that we've just talk, been talking about? Right. So what do I know? Well, I know a thing or two. Because I've got four children. Here's my, look. I've got a mountain of children. Oh, I know, aren't they? <laughs> right? And I've done all my contributing on the side, all of it, around working to support those whilst trying to ensure that I'm a present as a parent. So people have always asked me, well, how do you have time to contribute to open source? And the answer I've always given was, well, some people play Fortnite. <laughs> I've updated it since last year. Um, I play GitHub. Right? The point here is that I've made a choice. Okay? I don't have Netflix. I don't watch the new series on tele television. My wife thinks I don't like novels. I do like novels. I just haven't read one in an age and a day. Right? It's just that you have to kind of choose what you're bad at. Because you can't be good at everything. So I'm bad at Facebook. I don't have it. I'm bad at Twitter. I do have it, but I'm rubbish at it. I'm bad at so many things that I can't make the time for. That I can't make the time for. Because I have four children. Because I want to improve my Spanish and my Catalan. And because I like to cook. And I like to spend time doing all those other things. And I want to contribute to open source. Right? And it's not much time that I leave. I honestly don't have a lot of time to contribute. Uh, from a you know, for the, so I do the fellow role, and I work on Django REST framework as well on a paid basis. And then I have a little bit of time to do some open source. Okay? But it doesn't matter how little. So you find some time, a little bit of time. Like it would be half an hour a week. I mean it, that would be enough. An hour a week would be twice as much, right? But enough, right? So find some time, and then I want you to immediately limit it. Now, I talked about this again last year. But the important thing with contributing to open source is that you don't allow it to eat more time than you, you have specified. Because it can. And that's what leads to burnout, and that's what leads to all the problems with contributing to open source, is not limiting the commitment that you give. So if you take one thing away, take that, right? Priority number one is still self-care, okay? You have to look after yourself. There is this feeling, oh, I must fix that issue that I, you know, 
caused an issue by fit merging this bargain that's broken this and if i don't fix it now people won't be able to pip it people can go into their pip file and they can put two an equals and an version number in and pin to whatever version you don't have to fix it that night yeah you, you can fix it but look after yourself first okay and then the other piece of advice i would give is don't spread yourself too thin if you've only got a small amount of time focus on one thing it's better to focus on one package and do it well than sprinkle your effort everywhere okay so it looks like i do a lot you know, on paper, I'm a Django fellow, I contribute to Django REST framework, a Django filter. Django filter runs itself, right? There are virtually no issues and, you know, a few hours every, every major release of Django and it's, it's up to date, okay? The fellow role is separate. The paid time on DRF is separate, okay? Back in the day, I was working on Django REST framework in my spare time, in the time that I had. I was doing a little bit. And then Django filter was unmaintained. And it, when I first started with Django REST framework, it was just Tom and I went and helped him. And but by the time Django filter needed someone to look after it, there were five people working on Django REST framework and I wasn't doing very much at all. So I took on Django filter. And I was doing all my work on Django filter. I didn't do anything on Django REST framework for ages because I was busy and I didn't have the time. And then I got Django filter sort of, yeah, that was fine. And Django Crispy Forms was about to fall over. So I took that one, and I spent my time fixing that, and I was doing that for ages. And then those packages kind of run themselves. Django Crispy Forms. If anybody uses that and uses Bootstrap 4, then please talk to me afterwards, because I don't use Bootstrap 4, and there's a few, they're not hard bugs, but I haven't got the time to resolve them. They just need help with templates for Bootstrap 4. So if you use Bootstrap and Crispy Forms, please talk to me, and you can help me fix those. Um, if you want to. And now I've, though, but those two packages, they run themselves. And so now I've sort of taken on um, to work on channels so Andrew can step back from that. And all I've got is a little bit of time, you know, an hour a week or so to, to work on it. And I'm going to work on it at the sprints and I'm going to, you know, get fixed and bugs that I've been looking at. But on the day to day, all I do is handle the incoming tickets. Is it a new, okay, is this a new ticket? Is it a real one? Most of them aren't. Most of them are usage questions. Right, the key point is that in, in my volunteer role, in the bit of, the, of open source that I do for fun, I've only ever really worked on one thing at a time. Right? And that's, you've got to do, well, you don't have to do that, but I see some people contribute and they, they, they're just, they're everywhere, but they're not doing anything. And it's like, focus. Anyway, right. And then the third thing is keep a log. Right, because even if it's only half an hour a week, it adds up. I talked about this last year about being prolific. Right, it's it's not about being prolific in in this week. It's about being prolific over time. Right, it adds up. So the log is like an objective record of what you've done, and it's something you that you can talk about. Right? So getting into open source really changed the dynamic for me when I was trying to get gigs. Because they always are, oh, you know, can you give us some code samples? Well, no, because everything, I've, all my work is private, it's NDA, under NDA. But I open source stuff, it's like, yeah, well, you know, I do this, I do that, I do the other. And it really changed the dynamic. So keep a log of what you do, and then you can use it. And those silly interview questions that you get, describe time when you've used a pony to solve pressing development problem. Well, okay, it's in my log, and I can fill in that application question. And it, it, I've got something concrete to say there. Okay, you can link to the actual ticket, right? It's not just that I wrote in, in the application that I used Django to solve some problem. Here's the ticket where I did it. That's much more impressive than all the other candidates filling in the same question. So keep, the, keep a log. And then uh, you can also use it to help get a reference come and help me on my package and then over a period of time, I'm going to be ecstatic to give you a referral, especially if you can email me and say, yeah, Carl, do you remember that I've been contributing? Yeah, I do. Look, here's all the things I've done. Oh, and by the way, can I have a reference? Right? Of course, of course. Okay. And finally, the reason to keep a log, and as I get older, this matters more and more, is that it's an aid memoir. Okay, so I've solved the problem, I've learned something, but I can never remember it a week later. But I can just search for it 
and up comes what I, what I did and the notes I took. And then I've got that solution in my pocket for the future. Um, your log doesn't have to be high tech. It can just be plain tech files in a folder. Your computer can search, right? Don't build a tool yourself. Anyway, what did I say there? I said limit your time, right? Find some time, then limit it. Focus on, don't spread yourself too thin and keep a log. They're the three sort of tricks, okay? So, actually contributing. I'm going to tell you how to get involved and how to get a hold of us when it's not working. The contributing guide. You'd like to contribute to Django, but you don't know how this document will explain our process and how to get involved. Well, that sounds promising, right? It's not the solution. It's a, it's a starting point. But have a read. There's loads of good stuff. It tells you the code style. It tells you how to build the docs. It tells you how to run the test suite. It tells you how to write a a new test. It tells you how to bisect the regression. There's lots of good stuff in it. Do give it a read. Um, it's brilliant. On there it says, um, join Django developers. Okay, well, you're busy. You haven't got time for another mailing list, I know. And a lot of it's not relevant to you. But that's fine. Join it anyway. Turn off the notifications. It becomes, as you get involved in Django, it becomes more relevant. So check it once a week. Go and have a browse and see if there's interesting topics. Much more important than joining Django developers is Django Core Mentorship. There's another mailing list. And this is like, well, this is the, we need to advertise this more. But it's a place where experienced contributors have signed up to help you get a start contributing. Right, they're ready there, waiting to answer your questions. Don't email it, hi, I'm Fred, I'd like to contribute. Right. Hi, I'm Julie, I'd like to contribute. Hi, I've tried to install the, the test suite, but I can't get it going, and here's the error I get. Give people a chance when you, um, email the list, but email us. There's people there who are really going to help you get up and running. Um, so join that. Then you need to get set up with the code. Now in principle this is easy. Clone the repo. Okay, git clone. Create a virtual env. Python env. The env. You've done this a load of time. Install the requirements. Pip install minus r. Right? And run the tests. There's run tests, run run tests, brilliant. That's it. In principle. Right? Sometimes it doesn't work because I don't know, you haven't got the right library installed in the right place or something. But if it doesn't work, Django for mentorship. I've got this error when I tried to run the test suite. If you can't get it running locally, there's a virtual machine that will run the Django test suite for you with all the different databases. There's a Docker um set up now as well. So get the Docker box project, whichever whatever works for you. But get the code installed, run the test suite, see what it looks like. Fine. Then once you've done that, you've got to find a ticket. And this can be hard. Remember, there was 1,300 open accepted tickets. Well, where do, I, where do I begin? The docs, the contributing guide says to look for easy pickings ticket. But this isn't going to cut it. Because there are 1,300 accepted tickets, of which approximately 13 are tagged easy. Right? Now, we're not using this fag right, but it's not binary. It's not like there are 13 easy tickets and 1,300 phenomenally hard ones. Right? The, the, most of the tickets are no harder than the problems you already solve every single day in your use of Django. Most of them. Yes, they need a bit of time to work out what the issue is. Yes, they need a bit of your love and your effort, but they're not rocket science, generally speaking, okay? Why haven't they been solved? Well, because there's only half a dozen people regularly contributing on the code base and there's 1,300 tickets. So, there's a lot of opportunities there, right? Also, if you do start one, a ticket, you'll get input. Like, the tickets sit there with, because there's no activity on them, but if you just pick one and start working on it and comment or put open pull request or something, then, the regular contributors will come in and give you help. So just pick one and get started. But you can narrow it down. So by component is one good way. You can go into the track and you can look at the view tickets and you can put by component and you can choose. Now you can't see the, the numbers here, but the graph is the important thing, right? Most of the issues are in the ORM and then the admin and then it goes down. But if you, you know, if you want to focus on error reporting, well, there's only 10 tickets on error reporting. So if you were to narrow your focus, narrow by component, it makes it much more approachable. You're not faced with this wall of tickets, you get half a page. 
The third biggest area there, this, this one, is documentation. There are lots and lots of documentation tickets. So these are super, if you've, you know, if you've got strong written English, which everybody, you know, most of you have, you can find a documentation ticket and you can work on it and you can learn about Django and improve the documentation around Django and really make a difference to the, to, to the, to the community because the documentation is one of Django's biggest assets and it's one of our biggest areas to, to make improvements. You can also filter tickets by patch needs, patch needs improvement, or patch needs test, or patch needs documentation. So all the, all the there's, there's, there's lots of tickets that get started, but they never get finished because well, Django's, Django's quite good, right? So it can be quite difficult to get a, a ticket or a patch to the level where it's ready to be merged because if it hasn't got docs or tests, it can't go in yet. But there is a massive opportunity to find tickets that just need some test cases added and add the test cases and bring it forward and then we can credit you with a co-author and that's you contributing and that's an easy, that's a way to find tickets where you don't have to do the whole thing yourself because normally the solution is sort of, if there's a pull request open, the, the solution is half there. You've got to start. The other way is to look at open PRs. So there's like, I don't know, 180 or 200 open PRs on GitHub. Most of those have been inactive for quite a while because they got opened, they got some reviews, they, they need improvement, and the original author hasn't had the time to finish them. So you can just look through the PRs and sort of go, oh, okay, and you have to read the comments, work out what the review was, but you can contribute. There isn't going to be a single pull request author who doesn't want help with their stalled pull request. Right, so don't be shy there. Um, how else might you find something to work on? Well, is there a bit of Django that you're using that isn't right? So my first patch to Django was to do with the template um, system because there's a piece of code in um, Crispy Forms where it instantiates a um, template without specifying a back end. And in 1.8, that wouldn't work because you needed to specify the back end, but I, there was only one, so it, it's the default Django back end. Say, well, if there's only one, can we just use that? And yes, we can, and so I made a patch and I fixed it. Why was it my issue? Well, because I was the one who had the problem. Okay. And the other thing you can get in, involved with is other repos. So third-party third apps are Django's secret source. Right? Now, I learned on Django REST framework, and there were lots of projects out there that were all under-maintained, they all need a bit of help. If you've got time, especially if you use these packages, I mean, if you don't use them, don't help. <laughs> use, you know what I want to say. Right, just get involved and help on a, pack, you know, a package that you use. And that can be more approachable because the code, code base is smaller. As I said, I, I would love some help with boot, Bootstraps for support on Crispy Forms. If you want to help me with that, you know, I'm really, I'd be mega grateful. So find a ticket. Then can you help to triage that ticket? Is it a valid issue? What does triage mean? Well, is it a valid issue? Can you reproduce it? Can you come up with a test case that shows the issue in, in hand? If you can, that's often that's 90% of the job done. Right, the hardest bit is reproducing it and coming up with a test case, often. Okay. Once you've helped to triage it, well, the other thing you do is submit a PR. It looks easy. Um, this takes time, okay? You, first of all, you've got to you do the best you can, then you submit it and you get feedback, and you'll get lots of feedback, a little bit of the formula, oh, can you reformat this here? Oh, you've got a, a blank line here, you've got to, you've got to rewrap the comments, the 79 characters, loads of comments like that, plus other code changes. How about we restructure it this way? And then you'll go back and you'll make some changes and you'll get more comments, and this happens. Everybody gets the same, um, the same feedback, and it's all about quality, but it can feel hard, right? But don't take it personally. It's not meant to put you off. It's not meant to be anything other than, hey, let's make this patch really good because that way we keep Django at the standard which you all rely on, okay? If, it gets, if you get into problems, reach out. If you need help, reach out. If you're thinking to yourself, oh, I've started to pull requests, but now I you know, can't finish it, reach out. Django core mentorship again, okay? 
Send an email there. On this PR, I've got this review, but I don't know how to handle it. Can you have someone advice? Yeah, no problem. I'm here to help. I'm Carlton Gibson on GitHub. Just at mention me in a comment. I see it. I'll come and check out. Bam. You can do it, right? You really can. You are qualified. If you've looked, spent any amount of time looking at an issue, Googling it, looking for solutions, then right then, right there, you know as much about that issue as anybody. Okay? You might think you don't know enough. Oh, I'm, oh this, is, this is too hard for me. But nobody knows enough. Like, I'm not qualified for most of the issues that come up. I have to open up the code base, read through it, try and understand the issue. It's what everybody has to do. Okay. So after, after the conference, come to the sprints to do the practicals. I'm going to be at the sprints, and I'm, I'm going to be trying to work on channels, to a few um, thing, issues there that I want to close. But whilst I'm doing that, I want to be helping you. So if you're going to come to the, to the sprints, I'll be there, and I'm going to be um, just trying to help you get started, help find tickets, help you do the pool you through these steps as much as I can if you need help. So come do that. And then, well, that's just the start. For me, these are exciting times for Django. Django is mature. It's stable. It's in a really good place, right? It's the web framework for perfectness with a deadline. It's meant to solve the web crypt problem quickly. And for all its 1,300 open and accepted tickets, it does that very well for the vast majority of use cases out there. And the bit it doesn't do, well, we're kind of working on those. We want to get those done, right? We have major releases every nine months. We have fellows. We have conferences in glamorous locations. We have an awesome community that's unlike any other I know in tech, right? And we have a whole load of new keen contributors who are just about to go and install the code base, find, run, run the test, find a ticket, and get contributed. Um, we have a real opportunity to craft the future of Django here, to make it relevant for the next 10 years. So, come join us. Come feed the pony. Come code. That's it. Thank you. Listen, I said I wasn't going to take questions, but there's like 10 minutes left. So does anyone want to ask what I'm happy to? Or not? So we have the question microphone right over there. So if anybody has any questions, please line up. No? Yes? Hey, Daniel. Hey. Hey, it's good to see you. Um, first of all, great talk. Um, <clears throat> there's something that I've always sort of stopped me from uh, contributing to Django, and it's this notion that Django's feature complete, that it doesn't need my help. How do I, how do I get around that? How do I find out you know, what needs to be done? OK, so um, you, good question. New contributors or protective contributors, they often come along to the Django developers and say, hi, I'm, you know, I'm Elizabeth, I'm new, I'm gonna, I want to contribute, and I've got this great idea for a brand new feature. It's like, whoa, hang on. Because it's not the Django's feature complete, but most features now can be put in third-party apps, or if they can't, there's room for features, but it's difficult to find them. But there are loads and loads of bugs to fix, first of all. Right? So first, what I, what I personally would do if I didn't have an issue, but the best way is if I've got an issue that needs fixing. I personally am hitting this problem. But if failing that is to filter by component, find a component you like, and look through the existing issues and see if you can solve a bug or two. That would be the first place. And once you've solved a bug or two, then maybe your feature starts to make more sense. Maybe you see a different way around it, but it doesn't need it. Or It's not that we're anti-new features. It's not that Django's feature complete. It's just to come from nowhere and say, I've got this brand new feature, it's going to be this giant expansion to Django, it's like, ah, that never, it's never going to work. And that's often what happens. Um, so focus on bugs would be my first. And do a couple of smaller patches to get your feet wet and get involved. 
Thank you. Okay, I'm going to, I, I don't uh, need it. Russell, do we have any questions from the internet? No. Fine, okay, it's too early in the morning for the internet. Fine, okay, that's, that'll do then. Cool, thank you very, very much, everybody. Okay. Thank you.